a professional corps that has uh, gotten better and better over the years and has been able to represent the United States positively around the world, uh, places where the president and the candidates, candidates uh, don't go, and where um, we know the country, we know the language, we know the, uh, the needs of Americans uh, and the American nation to, uh, to relate to these countries. I was in the Navy, uh, and I lived in Naples. I was a shore patrol officer in Naples and, and uh, wanted to be a chemical engineer. And I suddenly uh, discovered living abroad, uh, U.S. interests, uh, the Soviet, the Cold War was, was at its height, and I decided to become a Soviet specialist and uh, met a lot of foreign service officers in Naples. and. Uh, went back, got a graduate degree, and went to the Foreign Service. Public diplomacy is a, is a fairly recent term, as you know, and actually I'm chairman of the board of the uh, Center for Public Diplomacy at USC. And it's been an aspect of, of American relations abroad and at home, really, uh, explaining in a way that other people can understand why we do what we do. Who, who are we? Um, what are we thinking about you? Uh, and, and how can we explain what we're doing about you? Uh, I think that way of projecting um, the core of U.S. interests and policies uh, has never been done well. Um, and I think particularly over the last decade, 15 years, it's been seen as a, as a core issue in U.S. foreign policy. And if you don't know what, what, if you don't know yourselves, if you don't know who they are, who the country you're, you're talking to is, you can't put the two together. Uh, you must know who you are to begin with. What do you stand for? What does your country stand for? And you must know how what you say resonates with countries abroad. And I think this is a big problem with non-professional diplomats is that they assume that everybody out there is American, or if they're not, they should be. And you talk to them as if they're our pals, our Americans, uh, and you don't. You have to find different ways of telling your story depending on who your audience is. Um, I did a lot in cultural diplomacy. Uh, we did a great deal in that area, and when I was in Venezuela, uh, oil was the big issue. This was, I was ambassador to Venezuela back in the, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and we were a close friend of that country at that time. And um, I told the, the press people that I wanted to be on the camera all the time about culture, about Venezuelan culture, about American culture, and I wanted them to be, to, I wanted my public profile to be around that issue and not around oil and military relations. Um, and we positioned me, because the American ambassador in those days was the highest profile ambassador in Venezuela. And I, des I decided that the best positioning for the American ambassador in Venezuela was around Venezuelan culture, its history, uh, American culture, its history, and uh, never appear in the papers with regard to our military assistance or our um, or our need for oil. And that's the sort of the essence of public diplomacy, I think. In, in Venezuela, it was, I mean, I was ambassador to two countries, Venezuela and Czechoslovakia. In Venezuela, it was huge. There, our relationship with Venezuela um, were dependent, particularly during the, the, the 70s, on assuring that they export as much oil as they could get because there was a shortage, you know, prices of oil were spiking, uh, gasoline in the country was spiking. So we, my basic interest was to work, my basic challenge was to work with the government of Venezuela to get them to provide more oil to the United States. And I guess built around that issue, we did a lot dealing with 
U.S. oil companies, with the export of products, with helping uh, the Venezuelan economy become more independent in agricultural production. It was a, uh, it was, I guess I spent 40 to 50 percent of my time dealing with U.S. businesses, uh, supporting their work in Venezuela, and we were the dominant uh, business community in, in Venezuela. Um, but oil was it, and I, had, I knew the oil industry upwards and backwards, and they knew I did. Yes, this is one of my favorite stories, which is not known very well. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, they, President Kennedy put together an, something they called the XCOM, which was a group of, of his advisors, cabinet members, Bobby Kennedy was there, um, McNamara, and, and uh, of course, McGeorge Bundy. And the only um, Foreign Service officer there was Tommy Thompson, who knew, uh, who'd served as ambassador to Moscow, who was one of our great experts after George Kennan. And in virtually every record of that 14 days uh, of discussions about what policy should be and how to avoid nuclear war, uh, Tommy Thompson, the ambassador, the former, the person who just returned from ambassador, who knew, who knew Khrushchev, um, was the one they said was by far the most valuable person in the room because he knew who Khrushchev was. He knew how to understand what they were thinking about and why he was saying what he was doing. And Bobby Kennedy, uh, in his book on the subject, makes it very clear that the person who, at, at a key moment, moved them in the right direction, which avoided war, was Tommy Thompson, because he knew who they were. I mean, this is my, one of my pet phrases, uh, know your enemy, which was not new phrase, it was back in the second century. Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War back in the second century. He's a Chinese a uh, general philosopher who tried to explain how you deal with the enemy. And his basic point is if you know the enemy and you know it well and you know yourselves well, you can always win. But it also the extension of that is if you know the enemy well, you might not have to go to war. You might have to find, you might find ways to deal with this problem. And um, the United States really historically has, certainly in the 20th, 20th century and the 21st century, have not felt the need or compulsion to know your enemy. We certainly didn't know Vietnam. It was all run by Europeans. Um, we certainly didn't know Iraq. All the Arabists were removed from policy making uh, and the basic mistakes in those first days afterward whether we should go in the first place, but also in the first days afterward. Um, it was all run by the military and by political people who knew nothing about uh, Iraq. Um, and and it's, a, uh, it's certainly a characteristic of where we are today. Uh, I guess my favorite story on knowing the enemy was when, after uh, Kissinger uh, became Secretary of State in 73, there was the, the Six-Day War in which uh, Israel um, invaded Egypt, and the whole region was in flames in a certain sense. And Henry, who was an expert on nuclear and, and Europe and, and to some degree the Soviet Union, um, knew very little about the Middle East. And what he did is he assembled the best group of foreign service officers we have. And I was working on the staff at the time, and I watched him do it. And he was skeptical at first, but he knew they had information he didn't have. And he proceeded over the next um, six months to work with Roy Atherton and Joe Sisko and a whole group of, of diplomats who knew the area, knew the issues, knew what had to be done. And he ran the show. He pulled the best out of them. And uh, in the process, learned a lot about the Middle East that he didn't know about. You don't find secretaries of state often doing that. They bring their own trusted advisors with them. But they don't draw on the core knowledge that we have, that 
that professionals had and have had and developed over, over 20 to 30 years by the time they become ambassadors, and they know uh, the issues, they probably aren't the decision makers. They're the, they're the advisors and they're the ones who help the Secretary of State and the President know their enemy. And um, many people think diplomacy is just about avoiding war. That's not about what it is. It's not simply that. It's telling the American story. It's, um, it's certainly negotiating agreements when you can find them present. But a core responsibility of the Foreign Service is to advise presidents and secretary of states on the real problem areas which might involve, as an alternative to diplomacy, military force. And uh, I always feel walking into Congress that here comes this striped pants former diplomat who um, all he wants to do is sell us out. He wants to give up everything in order to have peace. I mean, that isn't our role. It's the president's role to decide on the use of military force. It's our role to help him learn whether he really needs to do that and learn enough about um, the opponent or the adversary so that he can find ways to get around the use of military force. And I would argue that over the next 50 years, next 100 years of our work, that dimension of U.S. relations abroad is going to be far more important than it was in the last 50 years. After the revolution, we had two number of fabulous diplomats, uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and John Adams, who, who um, set a high standard. They weren't professionals. But after the revolution, uh, the American people didn't didn't like the idea of diplomacies and ambassadors. They didn't like it. Uh, that was European. It wasn't American. We were different. And we wouldn't get involved in dirty deals with other governments, dealing with potentates and, and kings. And, and, and so uh, for almost 120 years, we didn't have a professional diplomacy in, in effect. Uh, we didn't have a belief in the need for diplomacy. And as a matter of fact, Americans still don't understand why diplomacy is a profession and not just a practice that people learn on the streets. Um, so the creation of the F Career Foreign Service was sort of a beginning of taking elegant, educated men and turning them into professional diplomats who understand languages, who uh, understand countries uh, in Europe and around the world, and build a capacity uh, to be able to go anywhere, learn languages, whatever opportunity they have, and uh, represent their country on a professional basis over a long period of time. Today, much of foreign policy is managed by people out of think tanks, bright people, who sat in their offices and at universities, uh, learned a lot about the country academically, and they come in as academics and think tank specialists who have a lot of ideas. And ideas about a country are different than living in a country, experiencing how you work a country. One of my favorite stories about, about um, the Kissinger era was he asked uh, a young diplomat at the time to go to Syria before we had real relations and Henry wanted to go see the father Assad during this tense period. And he asked um, this diplomat who, who'd served before in Syria, he'd served in, 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 uh, he'd been in Egypt, he'd been in Israel, he'd, he'd been all over the region. And he asked him, tell me how Assad is different from Sadat. How is he different from Golda Meir and, and Faisal? And the diplomat wrote back shortly after he'd arrived three messages, three long messages, which should all be the primer for those of us who don't believe in diplomacy. And the first one was to tell Henry how it feels to work in the bazaar of Alexandria, of Jidda, 
of um, uh, in the marketplace of, of, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, and how that differs from the bazaar in Assad in um, in Damascus, and that little essay just thrilled Henry Kissinger. He thought giving him insights on how the how dealing with Assad is different from dealing with Sadat and why, um, and that the cultural insights. Uh, you can't get if you don't live there, if you don't have the experience of understanding what a diplomat eventually gets from living three, four, five years in a country. Um, how do you communicate? What works? What doesn't? What do they need that you haven't thought about? What do they need that you can give them that will not interfere with the objectives of your policies toward that country? Um, so I guess uh, knowledge of all countries is something we don't have or use. We have a lot of it through the Foreign Service. You have some of it through think tanks. But the experience of actually dealing with people is the core of diplomacy. I guess the first, the first thing I think about is, is family. Um, I have four children who were in the Foreign Service with me. Um, and uh, during the first, my first seven years, we moved four times for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, it's disruptive for the children, it's disruptive for the family. Uh, I eventually divorced. Uh, my oldest kids didn't have the type of stability of education that they should have had or medical treatment. And, and I guess the biggest cost I had was from the standpoint of, of my family. Uh, they're okay now. It's been a, it's been a difficult uh, period. But uh, and the second, I think, kids today go out and they want to go to Wall Street. They want to make money in the financial markets. You don't, you don't go in the Foreign Service for anything other than public service. The perks are fine. But when I was living in, in, in uh, when I was ambassador to, um, to Czechoslovakia, and I was a very senior ranking ambassador, um, the, the last year I was there, I was, had a take-home pay of $30,000 a year. And um, so you forego an economic benefit from the skills you have. And you do it because uh, you are serving a, a valid profession, but most importantly, your country. I and mean, I was in my I was in the Navy for for five years, and I went from the Navy into the Foreign Service. And it's not because I'm just a bureaucrat; it's because basically I believe in in my country. And I think that's what people give up financial benefits; they give up family. Uh, they don't give up family, but they, they very often find their family has suffered from the, that, that period. I, I personally didn't have any periods of, of living in, in threatening places. I mean, in Venezuela, uh, practically every day there was a threat in my life, and I had a lot of cars around me, but it didn't, it didn't particularly bother me. Uh, um, the benefits are enormous, though. I mean, the, the, the joy of service, the, uh, the sense that you're dealing with things that are important to your country um, and uh, to the world, given our role in the world, is, is, is exhilarating if, if, you, if you like that mission for your life. The United States is, is the biggest player we're the loudest player. We're the most uh, looked at actor in the world. Um, and there's so many images of the United States through our films, our, our television, through the, the public knowledge of how we treat ourselves at home and the tragedies that we have in our lives. Um, we are very public and big. Is there another side to the United States that you, living abroad, don't understand about us? 
do we have a, one of the great literatures? Do we have one of the great traditions of art? Is our, Munich, is our music uh, among the best in the world? Um, are the values we have not registered daily in the television? Um, and I guess my sort of center focus uh, abroad was to tell the story of American culture, which is one of my passions. And I even went, I left the Foreign Service and went to be president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I was, you know, I, that's why I left, um, because that was my other real interest. Uh, so I found that bringing writers uh, wherever I went, I brought some of the great American writers who were all friends of mine to visit me in Venezuela and in Moscow and in, uh, and in, in Prague. Uh, the, the benefits to um, our mission is to try to provide a dimension to American society that people don't get. And they don't get a core aspect of who we are and how rich our culture is. Um, so I, I guess telling that story in as many ways as you can tell it, why are we really unique? What's different about us? And um, each of us has his different obsession on how to get at that subject. I mean, some really care about law. Some care about justice. Uh, I cared about culture. But having people tell those stories is what um, diplomacy is all about, part of diplomacy is all about. The, the, the transnational issues, and like, like climate change and, and uh, um, global warming, I, I guess they were not as prominent during the Cold War, which was my basic experience. I left just before the Cold War ended. Uh, and during my time, the focus so, was so completely on the U.S.-Soviet com competition, and that was most of what I did, uh, aside from promoting U.S. economic interests in Venezuela. And certainly in, in Prague, the core issue was the Warsaw Pact versus NATO and, and uh, the repression of the Czech people by the, this Soviet-imposed government in 1968. So I, um, I mean, today obviously it's it's extremely important. Um, my daughter is very active in the climate. She's one of the most active people around in the climate change uh, debate. Um, and if I were a diplomat today, I'm sure it would be a, a, in the front forefront of what I was doing. But that not, was not my experience. Yeah, you know, I I knew George pretty well, and I, I was actually I spent a year at the Institute for Advanced Study when he was there, and we spent a lot of time talking together. And uh, the wonderful thing about George is he really knew Russia. He knew the Russian culture. He knew the language. He um, he knew enough to be angry about what they stood for. But he knew also enough to know that this was not a cultural distinction of the Russian people, that they weren't fundamentally communist. And they were um, appealed to him. So he had a combination of sympathy for the people and for what they could be, and unfortunately what they haven't become yet, um, and uh, the dreadful aspect of, of Soviet communism and Stalin. Um, so that long telegram uh, presented to Truman and, and uh, George Marshall and, and Dean Acheson and, and the others in, in that formative period of U.S. foreign policy where we really began to look at a role that we would play in the post-World uh, post War II period. He defined um, in a way what we had to think about as a nation. Now, George later has disassociated himself from some of the interpretation that was given to that long telegram and to the X article in Foreign Affairs. But 
he helped presidents say, aha, this, this is the aha moment. We know now how to think about what, how do you play out from a policy standpoint what George is describing is the challenge in the next decades of the presence and the policies of the Soviet Union. And um, it helped guide one of the most important periods in American history, which was how we built, helped build the European community, how we helped build NATO, how we defined uh, our foreign policy as, as, a, as really an effort to not go to war but compete and show that we, that our sense of purpose and values and uh, nationhood um, was the strongest, and we did. Um, uh, in fact, I think they proved themselves the worst rather than we, much more the strongest. Um, but that period was shaped by this one man in a certain sense, and he, he helped presidents and the second, Dean Ash, the Secretary of State, uh, think about policy in a different way. And that's, that's the type of thing that the best of us can do. Yeah. By the way, I, I, uh, I knew Harry Truman, and I, and I actually was going to Moscow with, with President Eisenhower, so I had, I had that type of experience. I was around during that period. And I think overcoming the um, mistakes of the First World War, the, the Treaty of Versailles, which punished Germany, uh, which probably one of the worst treaties we've ever been associated with was the Treaty of Versailles, because it, it gave way to the, to the Second World War. It set the stage for Germany uh, that rose again uh, in anger against all of their neighbors um, and feeling very superior to them. The Marshall Plan said, look, we now know what's important. Europe has to rebuild. And uh, particularly in light of the, uh, of the threat of Soviet communism, we have to make this world, which we have participated in helping destroy because of their own the war they began, um, we have to rebuild it. And I, I think it probably is one of the great moments in American history. Looking back, it didn't cost us that much money, but the payout was enormous because we thought through, um, we knew what the problems were, and we identified the problems. We took the time to identify the problems. Americans don't have patience. We don't want to think through long-term strategies. That was a big moment for the United States to think about a strategy that would carry us through those decades and help revive one of the great sort of legacies of the United States has been, uh, has been what we did to help Europe. Um, so the, the Marshall Plan, um, which was really designed by others, but certainly George C. Marshall was the the figure who uh, deserved the honor that he got for that name uh, was was one of our great legacies. I, and I, I think the story of how it was put together should be a um, instructive for everybody who wants to look and see what does a strategy look like. How do you think about long-term objectives? I wish today, when you think about the Middle East, we had people who could pull together their thinking um, and say, look, this ISIS problem, it's going to be around for a while. Let's not try to put it together. Let's not try to put a coalition together overnight. Let's, let's see how over a long period of time we can redefine how the Sunni and Shia think about who their enemy is in the region. Um, and we've got a book coming out this week that starts to talk about that. Um, I guess I'd say that, that the problem with the U.S. government has been over the years that we don't know how to have a Team B. We don't know how to have a situation where policy is made by testing it against an alternative policy. Um, 
at their best, the Foreign Service officers can do that. Um, and at times there have been moments where a team of Foreign Service officers have been asked to sort of say how, how might another policy be given the fact this one's in trouble. There was an effort to do that a little bit during the Vietnam War. But the overriding need to associate with what the president, what they think the president thinks and is determined to do, um, makes it very difficult for people to oppose policy or even suggest that we get together and have an alternative policy. Foreign service officers, career diplomats, people who are interested in policy rather than just analysis, uh, can do that in ways that others can't. I mean, a, a difference between a think tank person and an academic and a foreign service officer is the academics will be very good at telling you what the problem is. The best the foreign service says, okay, this is what you do about it. This is how you deal with it. These are the policies that flow out of what we've analyzed. And it seems to me that's, um, uh, we're dealing with policy. We should always be dealing with policy. But we have to do it on the basis of the knowledge we've developed over our 30 years serving, serving our country. Presidents, American presidents, don't want it. That's the problem. Um, there are not many. I mean, interestingly, Kissinger was, I mean, uh, uh, the Nixon-Kissinger relationship was interesting because Nixon did have a knowledge and, and interest. Whatever he was as president, he certainly had a knowledge of, of what, of how to deal with an adversary and his, his magnificent opening to China demonstrated how time, patience, understanding, all of them came to play in a strategy that worked. Um, and, and I guess uh, most American presidents, Roosevelt to begin with, he was sort of the first who defined this, they were offended by diplomats. Uh, Roosevelt wanted to make his own policy. He didn't consult his Secretary of State uh, hardly at all, and um, didn't even include him in, in the talks with the Soviets in Yalta and, and, and Tehran. And, and, um, and, he, um, uh, and he set a tone which was broken only during a couple of periods. Uh, particularly during the, um, the Truman-Atchison period and Nixon-Kissinger, to some degree Reagan and, uh, I mean, uh, George W. Bush, H. W. Bush and, and Baker, um, and I guess you'd have to say Schultz um, had played part of this role with Reagan. But there, the tradition has been presidents want to run their own policy. They don't want to be told by a bunch of foreign service officers what, what's the right way to go about it. And until the, the mentality of our presidents change, until presidents realize that they need to know more about what is happening in U.S. foreign policy, how it can be fixed. Um, I, you know, I've, I've been involved so much within uh, the Foreign Service when I was there trying to answer this question, what, how do you fix it? How do you get a larger presence and a larger voice for what we, the Foreign Service, can bring to policymaking? And um, it depends on individuals. If, if a president decides he wants to hear what you have to say, uh, you have a say. You have an opportunity, and you should make, take very use of that opportunity. Not to lecture the president, but say, look, Mr. President, you have these options and we believe that the option you have right now is to um, is the wrong the one you've selected is the wrong one uh, or we would like to tweak it for a while and I think um, as as good as President Obama has been he is not surrounded by people who know the answers to these questions 
Uh, neither was his predecessor, um, and neither was Clinton. They were all chose to use the think tank approach, people they trusted and had been near, close to. And so what's happened is you look at the State Department now and you look at the NSC, and you rarely find a career diplomat in positions of authority. And Bill Burns is the one person who has really been a savior of American foreign policy during this period, I think. Um, and uh, you have more and more um, people with no experience, a lot of brains, a lot of good political influence, a lot of clout, a lot of access, but they miss that ingredient um, that uh, makes it possible for them to understand what that country's like. How do they deal with their problems? How do we deal with their problems? And how do we deal with what we want in that relationship? And uh, you don't get that from sitting in a, in a think tank. Um, uh, I, um, the thought that somehow the Foreign Service will be eliminated or be homogenized into sort of a, a mixture of career diplomats who serve anywhere, who will in it for their country, who committed themselves to this task uh, early on, learned several languages, learned how to deal uh, abroad with an expert. The, the difference between that and an expert who, who's read a lot, maybe learned the language of a, of a given country, maybe traveled there academically, but not lived in the, in the guts of how this country operates, not having access to this experience. Um, this uh, deprives, uh, enables the, the Foreign Service officer to present options for a president that somebody who's academically bright and articulate can't provide. If um, so, I, I gather there is some trend to think that the Foreign Service um, should be just part of a network of people who deal with foreign affairs and um, not uh, maintained as a as a as a career service. I, I my, my favorite story on that subject is Malcolm Toon, who was ambassador to Moscow. You might have heard this story before. But when uh, he was meeting with an admiral who was then uh, chief of um, Southcom during the, uh, the Southern Command of NATO, and it was an American admiral, and I knew many of these people. Um, and the admiral went to Moscow to see uh, uh, before his retirement, and he was sort of visiting the, the region, and he went to Moscow. And he asked Toon, he said, you know, you know, I'd like, to, when I get out of, the Navy, I'd like to um, become an ambassador. And Malcolm said, you know, I have the same interest. When I get out of the Foreign Service, I want to be an admiral. And the admiral said, oh, you can't do that. You know, you, you, you can't even think about being professionally uh, prepared to do this. And, and Mac just left it there, you know. It is a profession. It is a profession. We send uh, bundlers and fundraisers for presidents, they send them to countries they've never been to before, never mind knowing the language. I mean, I look at the number of ambassadors who've been sent to countries to which, major countries to which they've never set foot on, and I wonder how anybody thinks they can provide uh, the value um, that is needed in trying to understand uh, what this country's all about, how do we deal with them, and be able to sit down with somebody who knows that country rather than somebody who, who knows nothing about it. Um, now, I argue, I understand that many presidents want to have payoffs for people who contributed them. I understand that. That's part of our culture. I understand that uh, many countries abroad, particularly the major countries, want people who have clout with the president. Those are two dynamics that work. Um, that I understand. Um, but to do that, you give up knowledge. You give up knowing your enemy, your adversary, even your friend. And uh, you're left with the need to have to uh, tape, tape them to find out 
what they think rather than sort of glean it from an understanding of people who know those countries. I am befuddled by that question too. I, I don't. I don't know how you do it. I, I don't. You know, the the issue of of American ambassadors and diplomats in general getting out among the people, telling the story, being all times uh, public diplomats uh, who who were. Um, able to have access is, is a real challenge in most countries now, in many countries. Um, and how the uh, social media uh, can replace that, uh, to what degree can that uh, personal contact be over, be compensated for in other means. I'm, I'm not out there, I don't know. Um, I'm sure there have been um, some model diplomats who can tell you more than I can about how do you do it today. It's very difficult for me to think about it because when I was in the Soviet Union, I visited every republic, all 15 republics I visited. I knew people all over that country. Uh, my Russian was really quite good and, and I met um, a range of people that gave me a, a scale of, of understanding that I think is, is, was unique. Um, how you do that, even in Russia today, never mind uh, uh, in the Middle East, uh, where you really need to know how the bazaar functions, uh, you need to know how people think about us, um, how they think about their own country. Uh, I don't know how you do that. And, and I, I, in Latin America, it's probably still possible, except for in a few countries. Um, Europe, I think, by and large, you can do it. Uh, and the mysteries are still there in Europe. You know, we still don't, we probably understand Europe much less than we did 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And um, Asia, I suspect there are parts of Asia where you have a lot of access, certainly Japan, I guess China, Korea. Um, but it depends on where you are, how you exercise your, your responsibility and your privilege of getting to know a country. Well, I think it's wrong. It's a proxy war in the sense that, that Assad wants to stay in power and he's using whatever uh, he, can, he can get to remain in power. Um, it does happen to be a sectarian war, like many of them are, in the sense that the people who are out of power are the majority, the Shia, I mean the Sunni. And, and uh, so he, Assad, has, uh, and the Alawites who, who form his government, are really sort of honorary Shia, they're not Shia. Um, and um, so he draws on the support he can get from where he can get it, from Iran, from Hezbollah, and from Russia, who are neither Sunni nor Shia, as we know. And so I think to see it as a, as a proxy war is, is, is misunderstanding, or not, is, is distorting slightly the nature of how this all began. Assad family want to stay in power, and they'll do what they can to stay in power. Um, and the sectarian thing is interesting, uh, the surrogate war. Um, the, uh, the, the Shia um, confluence of forces there from, from Hezbollah and particularly Iran um, want to see um, uh, Assad stay in power because the, uh, their influence had spread significantly after we got rid of Saddam Hussein, the Shia took over because they're a majority. Uh, then um, Syria, uh, which really became increasingly an honorary Shia state uh, run by Shia, um, gave them a larger voice in, in the Levant than they'd had before, and which had frightened many, many of the Sunnis. But today, you have a situation that I think is a unique opportunity for all the countries in the region 
Sunni and Shia to say, look, ISIS is different. They're neither Sunni nor Shia. They're just a different phenomena. The fact that they happen to be Sunni should not blind us to the fact that we need Assad's military force, we need Iran's military force, we need Hezbollah to combine with uh, the Saudis and the Gulf states working against ISIS with the Sunni in those countries and treat it as, a, as an invasion, as it were. I mean, the best story that I like to use as an example is that the first Iraq war was uh, conducted by George H.W. Bush with the idea that here is a state, a Sunni state that has invaded another Sunni state, Iraq invading Kuwait. They moved in, which enabled him to build an alliance with the Gulf states and with other countries in the region to fight against this Sunni state. This, this Hussein ran, Saddam Hussein ran the country as a Sunni. Um, and it, it wasn't sectarian in the sense, it was, it was a violation of another country by a dictator. Uh, in this case, you have uh, basically an invader. I mean, this isn't just a terrorist organization. This is a hybrid, at least, a group that says it's a state. They've occupied another state. Um, and they've occupied Sunni territory in, in Syria and Sunni territory in Shia-governed um, Iraq. Now, to me, it's a perfect example of how Sunni and Shia can come together to try to defeat uh, the role of, the, of, the, um, uh, of this ISIS group, which is so horrid. Uh, that all of them have to dissociate themselves with it. And there, there, there's much a threat to Jordan, Lebanon, maybe eventually uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, never mind Turkey on the border, as they are to Iran. Uh, so um, I think it's a mistake to call it a surrogate war.